Here we are at uh, Shabbat in Montana, and we have Eric to thank for this awesome rendition of uh, a menorah fit into the architecture of his labors <laughs> for the last couple weeks. And we're going to have a study as usual with Eric, and he's going to tell us something good. And now we go to Eric. Well, hey, you want to take a quick picture of this just no. for what it's worth? No? Okay. Just no thanks. So, we just did a couple videos which aren't up yet. This is June, what day is today? 27th. So we'll get them up in a couple days. And the last one you were talking about is Isaiah 3, 9, where part of the verse says, they will eat the fruit of their doings. And I said, hey, that's Samachai and Pei. They will eat the fruit of their doings. That's actually Pei, I, and Samach. So that's the part of the Mishkan pattern lining up with the Samach being the menorah, the fruit being the menorah, being the tree that bears fruit. What we do, the Samach. Doing righteousness or doing wickedness. That's part of the whole elaboration of the Mishkan pattern. Bearing the fruit and assessing the fruit is the letter ayin, drawn like the picture of a fruit or the picture of an eyeball. Fruit with a stem and a seed in and of itself, depending on how you draw it. And then eating, that's the letter pay. So that's Isaiah 3, 9, and 10. And we related it on this other video that we're going to have going up to Kahilat 3.15 which is otherwise known as Ecclesiastes. Kahal, Kufhe Lamed, is the assembly, which got turned into the word church, or kirk. Anyway, the idea of eating the fruit of your doings goes back to that often repeated statement that Yahweh makes that a man's way is returned on his own head. Mm. That's built in as a foundation of the universe. Not only the foundation of the universe, but it's the word mishvat, memshin peitet, which is the foundation of Yahweh's throne. So not only is this idea of there's scales of balance and there's a fulcrum and the, the teeter-totter, what you put in this side comes back on you. So we expressed this in a video down by the river last week. And this idea of what comes back to an individual person, what comes back to a family, generational curses, what comes back to a nation, what comes back to Israel at large, according to your deeds, your actions, your intentions, it comes back on you. That's, that's what is going to happen. So, there's this little phrase about Karma. Oh, that's from Indian mysticism. You know, dot, not feather. Little joke, but it's, you know, in America we can't tell the difference. You know, oh, yes, I understand. <laughs> we have to qualify which people group we're talking about. So, and I say that because if you mention the word karma, K-A-R-M-A, -A, yeah, that's another religion, that's heathen, that's Hindu, that, it's like, you listen, all I mean by that is what you do comes back on you. And whether it, you're talking about the afterlife or another life or uh, reincarnation, it don't mean any of that. No offense. It's just we use words to speak of concepts. And so if you mention one word that, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. So if I can pictographically or pictorially express a word like karma, I'm not invoking another religion or the names of false deities. I'm mention even though somebody might who knows about that stuff might say, "Oh, that's directly associated." I'm just saying, in my crazy, uh, you know, English American Greco-Roman Christian mind, I'm just saying, "Oh, what you do comes back." That's it. That's all we mean by that. And when he says, "With the measure you use, it'll be measured to you," when Yahuwah says that. When Yeshua said on the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew 5, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's the same concept. A man, a nation, 
a people will eat the fruit of its own doing. So we're going to look at that. Just We're going to zip through Ooh. Jeremiah pretty fast. And I might have gone through some of these things before, but just for what it's worth. Depending on the length of this video, there's a couple things I wanted to get into also. Then we'll go through Jeremiah. So a, a few months ago, I did a study on video about the ephod, the breastplate that the high priest wore, the 12 stones. And Exodus 28, 21, it says, The stones shall exist placed according to the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names, engraved as a signet, man, accordingly his name, or each man's name, shall be placed 12 tribes. Now that's the way it's read, I'm just looking at word for word in the Hebrew. Veha abenim, well the word aben, eben, is the word stone. Tav he yod yod nun, taha yayin, they shall exist. Well the interesting thing about that word is yod yod nun is the word for wine. So why is the word for wine the same root of the word for existing? Because you smell the wine, you, take a, you, you look at the nuances and the aspects of the wine. Yoked according, ayin lamed, to shin mem tav. Well, the word shin mem, shemet, al shemet, there's no vav in there, it's not shemot. So the word shin mem is to be placed names, places, but it's also the character, quality, aspect. And we'll see that in another verse here later. Bene Israel, my son Israel. Shin Tav Yod Mem, that's where, well, that goes back to Shin Tav Mem, which is the number two. Ayin Shin Resh He, Ashra, that's number ten, but it also means wealth. So the number twelve in Hebrew is two ten. They don't say twelve. Mm -hmm. Al I am Lamed again, Shin Mem Tav Mem. Well, now this is a little different. Their names, Shin Mem Tav Mem. Previously, it was just Shin Mem Tav. Mm -hmm. Then the word Petav Vav Chet Yod, Patochi. And then Chet Vav Tav Mem, Chotam. Ish Al Shamo, that's man according to his name. Then here's the same word that we saw in the beginning, Tav He Yod Yod Nun, Ta Yin which would be, they shall exist, and then you might say, like, like smelling or savoring the nuances of wine. And wine is known for all these different characteristics that people associate with it. So what I'm saying is that because the word wine is yod yod nun, then as you're analyzing these words, and you know that, you could say, well, what is it about wine that has to do with this phrase that simply means it will be. It exists. There's something about the essence of its character. So I can associate this, you might say, study or appreciation of wine to this study and appreciation of the names or the placement of these 12 stones. And I'm, and I'm saying that is a, this is one piece of the analytical aspect of the erectology study. It's not just, oh, look up the words in the dictionary, but it's look at associated words etymologically or associated with some English and Spanish, Yiddish, Ladino, things that pull in different Hebrew forms. And, and even like we said, the word samurai is a Japanese word that goes back to literally the exact same consonantal phonetics as shomri, which is to say, guard, guard me or my guard. The first commandment given to Adam was guard the garden. That was the word shomri, shin mem rashod. Anyway, then hear this lashani ashar. So lamed shin nun yod ayin shin resh. Two words, but the, previously they said, oh, that's the word twelve. But the but the first time it was shin tav yod mem mm -hmm. alef shin resh hey. So, well, that's just two and twelve. There's two words for number two. So I, I suggest there's a reason. And then the word shin bet tet, which is strike or smite, but it's also tribe and scepter. It's also the word hammered. And a related word, shin bet tet, bet tet, is the word for equisetum. And so the horsetail plant 
equicetum is the geometric model that I found to be associated with the structure of the Hebrew alphabet. So I'm going to go through this real quick. That's just setting up what this was. If you're looking at Exodus 28, 21, where it says, Petochi Chatam. So it's translated, engraved as a signet. But the word Petav Chet, starting point, beginning, drawn sword, Petav Yod Chet He, or sealed with a kiss, like to say, now you're mine. Or it's a development, it's an engraving, set free, regained sight, expounded, a crumb of bread opened wide, freedom of speech. This whole idea of being able to study the Hebrew language now, after 2,730 years of the curse that Daniel hid and sealed, the Debarim and the Sefer, that now we can go back and look at this stuff from the Paleo-Hebrew perspective, I'm suggesting relates to this word, even though it's simply translated as engraved. The same way that something, when you engrave, it etches in, whether you use a hammer and a chisel or a uh, Dremel tool that, that, or whether you use a laser, you can grave into stone, you can grave into metal. And the idea to draw a sword is the beginning of a fight, to regain your sight and be set free. Well, that's the whole concept of... Uh, the ten tribes being sent into the dispersion, being lost, scattered across the face of the earth, and coming back. And yet, within the consciousness of what I might generically say the typical, average, general, eschatological Christian view, and when I say Christian, I'm taking into account there's Orthodox, who consider the Catholics to be rogue, and then the Protestants who the Catholics consider to be rebels and deviant, which is actually the word Satan, which is to say gone astray and adversarial. And then within the Protestant realm, there's some people I said, I remember hearing saying 40,000 denominations, and now it's up to 50 or 80,000 <laughs> different classifications that you could say these guys differ from those guys in some aspects, so they started their own with a, with a name, a label, a nomenclature, a, a world view, a cosmology, uh, and some kind of ideological distinction different than all the others. And then so the question is, well, who's right? And according to the, the Jewish perspective, even the Orthodox are a bunch of radical punks who went astray. So it's like, you know, how do you know where the truth is? Where does the truth lie? Or where do those who claim the truth lie, deal falsely, deception, falsehood? And then so there's that verse that we bumped into that I've mentioned numerous times. I think I wrote it down somewhere here. The Jeremiah. Gosh. Um, yeah. Isaiah 8.20, if they, according to the Torah and the testimony, the Tav Vav Resh He and the Ayan Dalit Vav Tav, Tav Ayan Dalit Vav Tav. Mm -hmm. If they speak not according to this, then there's no, eh, well, the word light is actually Shekhar, it's not or. And the word Shekhar is that with just the darkness, the pitch black midnight starts getting a little nuances of light, which you can kind of see about three or four o'clock in the morning. Typically, it changes throughout the year. But just as it's starting to get that different color of, dark blue. That's the word shakar. So there's differences of opinion what this verse means. Does it mean there's no daylight, there's no light at all, or does it mean there's not even a glimmer of light if they don't speak according to the Torah and the testimony? So then we could say, yeah, but the Spirit tells my heart that I'm correct. The Mormons say, you know that Mormonism is correct because there's a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because they have a burning in the bosom. I, I certainly wouldn't deny that reality. I certainly wouldn't criticize that experience that they're having and say, no, that's not true. I, I would never say that. I can't say that. I can't deny or say that if somebody had a dream or a vision, or some of these people have trips to, to, up to the heavens, the third heaven. I mean, quite a bit. You know, go to the what, Bethel isn't there? Aren't they like having that down in Redding, California, in the River Church up here? 
encouraging those experiences. It's like, I've never had those experiences, but I can't deny that anybody else is. But he said, according to the Torah and the testimony, but that was back in Isaiah 8. So if you, if you discredit the legitimate present concern and whether or not we need to regard that, then you're left up to your own as to qualify whether these things should be taken into consideration for being true or not. So we're going back in looking at these words and saying, how do you read what these words mean? So, if I reconsider what these words are saying, the stones, the essence of the stones, yoked shin mem tov. Well, mem tov is the word for dead, corpse, mat. Shin mem is a place, a place of death. My son Israel, my son Israel, a place of death, a name of dead men's names. Well, they're the ancient forefathers, but what else is this saying? So it can get confusing. But Shin Tov Yod Mem is a, to broach a, broach a hole or to stop something up. And then it says Ashwa, which is the number 10 or the word for wealth. And then Shin Mem Tov Mem, well, the word Shin Mem Tov again can mean executed, banned, place of death. But it also can mean stamped, marked, and branded. Shin Mem means existing, the word there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, or here, or designated, their designated location. And then you have the word Petochi, which means to open, or the starting point. Or like I say, the concept of sealed with a kiss, now you're mine, or, you know, like the marriage ceremony is the beginning of a certain aspect of a relationship. Somebody who says, I've taken the vow, I've sworn the vow, sealed with a kiss, sealed with some action, signing your signature, authorizes a contract to begin the term of its validity, its authenticity. Freedom of speech, set free, regained sight. Man according to his name, they shall be, exist. And then hear this word, difference, variance, scarlet, tooth, second, that's the word shani. So that word too is different than the first word too for stopping up or breaching a hole in something that's been sealed. And then this word asher, which means ten or wealth or riches. And then this word shin bet tet, strike, smite, tribe, scepter, hammered, equisetum. What's this telling us? I'm going to get into the 12 stones, but the idea here that The children of Israel, all 12 tribes, were criticized by Yahweh for going after Elohim Achrim, other gods, idols. Their heart has a tendency to stray, a great tendency to stray, from the ancient past and still today. That's just what we do. And because of that, there was a blessing offered, but there was a curse also, which we have inherited these ever since 721 BC, the northern ten tribes anyway, 2,730 years of a curse, which would have been over as of 2010. So what's on the outside of that curse? The opportunity to return. But if you go to Joe Dumont's website of sightedmoon.com, he's saying that as of just a couple weeks ago, it began another curse of 2,300 days of hell. Now, maybe Joe's correct, but to what regard? To whom? Who's going to catch that curse? What he says is, the scattered remnants, the, those of genetic descent of the lost ten tribes, which means Gad and Naphtali and Zebulun and Asher and all these guys, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, scattered all across the face of the earth, and especially the British holdings of England, Scotland, Ireland, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, United States, they're going to catch hell like the Holocaust, like the Inquisition, where the enemies of physically our enemies are going to be able to, allowed to be hunted down and slaughtered mercilessly. That's what Joe DeMond is saying is upon us. Is that true? Decide for yourself. Listen to what he has to say and, and determine why he says so. What are his calculations? It's having to do with the Jubilee year and where we stand and going back to Leviticus 26. My calculation of Leviticus 26, based on 721 B.C., seven times 
390 for Ezekiel 4, we've talked about this before without elaborating now, brings us to 2010. And if we're outside the curse, then something is, an option is available to us to return to the words of Yahweh. And we're going to run through Jeremiah just to point that out. But then I, what I'm bringing up this thing about the 12 stones is that perhaps there's a message in the order of the placement and the names of the stones linked to the names of the 12 tribes patriarchs. That's what this is concerning. So, the 12 tribes patriarchs, Leah, wife of Jacob, had Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Yehuda, and then Bilhah had Dan and Naphtali, and then Zilpha had Gad and Asher, and then Leah had Issachar, Zebulun, and then a, a girl was born, a daughter named Dina, and then Rachel had Yosef and Benjamin. There's the 12 children plus a 13th being Dina. So if we take the names of those tribes and compare them to the names of the stones, go back to the names of the stones. Adam, well it's actually pronounced Odom, that's an Odom stone, but it's spelled Aleph, Dalet, Mem, red, blood, man, and I will be similar. That's what the word Aleph, Dalet, Mem means. Next, next word. It's just simply translated topaz, which is a yellow stone, but it's Petet, Dalet, He. Well, Petet, as in the word Mem, Shin, Petet, Mishvat, Petet means stalemate, balance scales. And there is no other way in the dictionary to look up what that word means, but if there's no Tet, Dalet, but if you look at Dalet, He, well, Dalet, He, He, Again, just showing you the analysis of the words, means faded, dim, or discolored. Now, does that mean the topaz was not a vibrant yellow, but it was a faded yellow? Maybe, but you can't find that word. But what I can see is stalemate, or balanced scales, or equity, faded, dim, and discolored. What do I do with that? We'll get to that in a moment. The next word, bet, resh, kuf, that's the Q, tav, they say, well, they think that's the emerald. They think it's the emerald. Is it the emerald? Nobody knows. But it means Barack. That's like Barack Obama. And people say, oh, that's the word for lightning. <laughs> A flash of lightning. But also it means glitter, splendor, and morning star. So it's like a flash of lightning that's, bow, hey, well, it's a spectacular sort of... Again, it's not good or bad. It's just, that's what the word means. So if we look at those three, those are the three words in that order, therefore it would line up with Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. What's Reuben got to do with Odom or Adam? He was the firstborn in the word Reuben. Basically, Leah said, oh, I've got a man-child. Behold a son. So named him Reuben. But what does Reuben mean? We're just lining him up with that. Because Yahuwah discerned my humiliation. See, Genesis 29 and 30 is where you can find this. So, going back to the story, Jacob worked seven years to get Rachel as a wife. And then, some people say she was a twin with Leah. Leah had sad eyes or kind of doe eyes. or Rachel had a certain vibrancy and Leah was more... And yet they looked so similar. There's a veil or however that happened. Jacob was drunk or whatever, but they switched. And so Jacob married Leah, thinking it was Rachel, and then, ah, what happened? He had to work another seven years for Rachel. That's, that's the story. But he always kind of eh, wasn't really into Leah so much. He just scorned, despised. Eh, eh. And so Leah felt humiliated that her husband shouldn't care for her, shouldn't love her. Always wanted her sister. And that set up this strife throughout their whole life. But she said, ah, because Yahuwah discerned my humiliation, he's given me... Reuben. So what has that got to do with Oban? Remember, remember it means red blood man and I will be similar. Well, if you look at Aleph, Dalet, Mem, Aleph is a prefix letter that can mean I will. Dalet is a door or a choice. And Mem is something within, in the heart, where we hear his words and take on, look well to, nurture, like incubating a seed, like being pregnant to bring forth some kind of life. So the Dalit in between the Aleph and the Mem can be the choice within us. A way to decipher these words. And the word 
Dam, Dalit Mem, not only means blood or red, but it means to be similar, where we get the word dummy. A dummy is like a, a, a doll, a, 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 a version, a model of. So I could read this, I will be, Aleph, similar to, Dalit Mem, the choice, the Dalit, what I, what I choose to from within me, and then Mem, from within. I will be similar to how I choose from within. And then there's this verse that says, as a man thinks in his heart, so shall he speak. Or so you'll be able to, you'll, you'll know the fruit, you'll know the tree by its fruit. So there's these embedded concepts within these words. So it's like, if we value Yahuwah's words from within, then it'll express in our life, Samik, I and pay. As we bear the fruit, we will pay, eat the fruit of our doings. That's built into the fabric of the universe. So Aleph, Dalit, Mem, it's not just the red Odom stone representing Reuben, but it has to do with saying our intention, Aleph, is the proactive intent to do something. Dalit is a door, and Mem is this place where it incubates like a womb, a laboratory lining up with the labor in the Mishkan pattern where things are developed in order to noon to jump out and become the reality. And then Samic following the noon, it's the fruit we bear and then the ayan, the fruit will be able to be weighed, measured, and determined. So when you see people doing crazy stuff, stupid stuff, evil stuff, or good stuff, or intelligent choices, you can, you can bet there's something going on inside, which is the person's choice of character. Okay, so the, the word peitet is the scales of balance, this word mishvat, and Yahweh, because he wove that into the fabric of the universe, he says, according to as you do, according to as you think, according to as you determine to be, on the other side of this scale, this teeter-totter, he will see to it that it will be so. So then we can read Aleph Dalit Mem with Pei Tet Dalit He lining up with the word Simeon, which is actually Shin Mem Ayin Vav Nun. Well, the Shin Mem Ayin is not Sim, it's Shema. Hear, listen. And then Vav Nun is the one who is listening. So you could say Dalit He is not only discolored and dim or faded, it's without color. Well, that's like justice with, you know, blind justice, that, that, that kind of uh, iconic statue of the lady with a blindfold and scales of balance and a sword, you know, the, the symbol of justice, which is to say, without regard for rich or poor or famous or not famous, uh, big shot or peasant, there's no monkey business. Without modification, discolored, uncolorized, doesn't matter what race, doesn't matter what status, doesn't matter your family name, whatever's going on is what's going to be meted out. So see, the word for Dalit hay could be faded, dim, or discolored, but that's not to say, oh, it's kind of gray and kind of dissolved. It's just to say without effect, without art. And then the third word, lightning, glitter, splendorous. So here's a statement where Yahweh is saying to us, reading the first three stones, that according to what we harbor in our heart and express in our actions, what, you're going to get the lightning bolt or splendor? I mean, is that a lightning bolt a good thing or lightning bolt a bad thing? When I flew in here a couple weeks ago, boy, it was a spectacular lightning display, but lightning starts fires and kills people. It's like, again, you could turn, wrap your own story around this, but this is a statement. A statement to, a message to the 12 tribes of Israel. Like the names, like the stones. Put the two of them together. So for me to say you've got the Mishkan pattern, seven days of creation, you've got the, the Beatitudes, the Moedim, they look like they're separate and disparate, they have nothing to do with each other, but when you line them up the thematically, now you can reference and see exactly they fit. Same thing with the names of the tribes and the names of the stones. But if you say, well, the word is Simeon, what does Simeon mean? And it's like, I don't know, is Simeon, Simeon a type of monkey? But see, that's English words. You've got to go back and say, one who listens 
Shema on. English changes the syllabalization, you know, and with the different phonetic syllables, and things become incomprehensible. Okay, second row. Nun pe kaf, nafak, the name of the stone, possibly a turquoise. Kaf is a suffix meaning yours. Nun is a prefix means to put something in the action. Pe is an open mouth. Pe kaf also means a flask, a jar, or a cruise, which is to say some sort of thing that you pour out of. Nun pe kaf can mean start dripping. It's a little drip. Pay cough hay is a flow or a drop. Noon pay is a sift to sift or sieve. What's that? Nothing, nothing. Okay. Anyway, nothing. noon vav pay means to swing to and fro. It's a panoramic view or to examine closely. So now you picture the treetops sway back and forth. If you go up to a height or an elevation where you could, like treetop, you can get a panoramic view. All these were related words to Nun Pei Kaf lining up with Yehuda. Then you've got Sapphire, Samic Pei Yod Resh, probably blue, but we also get Sapphire, we get Sphere, and Spire, which is a point. Well, the Sphere is round, so back in the uh, World's Fair, what was it, 1936 or 39, they had, the, uh, they had a certain word for it, but there was a Sphere and a Spire that was the symbols of that World's Fair. Just to say, these, these two elements. Mm -hmm. um, then you go to Yod He Lamed Mem, Yechalam, Yechalam. It means as to strike or beat, suited or fitted. Well, does it mean to whack somebody, or does it mean something suiting? Well, if somebody's misbehaving, you whack them. That's fitting. Parental corporal punishment. It also is the word for diamond, which is Yod He Lamed Vav Mem, Yah. Halom. Well, this is Yod He Lamed Mem, so it's not necessarily a diamond, but that's as close as anybody can know. So that third name there, so you got Yehuda and then Dan and Naphtali. Well, Yehuda means now I praise Yah. Levi means attached to me, by the way. That was the previous third one, attached to me being splendorous and Barakah. So you have Yehuda, now I praise Yah. Dan means judged between or sephering. Sephering, samic pay resh is the word for scroll or counter number and to add the ing English suffix to it. And so if what we're doing is sephering. We're connecting the dots. We're trying to make sense out of things, hooking this to that, trying to find out like drawing constellations with connecting the dots of the stars. Dan. Well, they say, oh, Dan means judge, but it means like a referee or one who decides, or if you choose, do I go through this door or not? Do I make this commitment? Do I sign up? You ask Jesus in your heart, you know, you, you say the sinner's prayer, and it's like, did that really mean something? Well, you try bucking the system, and all of a sudden you've opened the door to the devil. And it's like, Grah! that's a Christian mind. Is that true? Well, they'll tell you it's true. As soon as you ask Jesus into your heart, and then all of a sudden the devil comes to test you and tempt you and to <laughs> try to pull you out of that decision. So what I'm saying, that's like a Dalit, and that's a noon. Dalit is a door, you make a choice, and noon, wham! What's going to happen? Well, you sign up for the blessing and the curse when you step into Yahuwah's kingdom and have to learn his ways. And if you betray the understanding of his ways, you're going to catch the curse. So even the Jews, from what I understand, if somebody wants to convert and become... Jewish or learn about Jewish, they say, oh, not so fast, get away, this isn't for you, this is more than you can bear. I mean, just look at the Inquisition and the Holocaust and the different pogroms of, of Russia and say, no, no, this is the truth. I, oh, oh. So they, they push you away three times and finally, like, well, if, if the family gets whacked, you're going to get whacked. If you want to sign up with this, you better do what's right because if you, if you start doing stupid stuff and bring tragedy down on the whole rest of the, the tribe, the family, the, the nation, then you're going to get that's why you always said go out and stone the people that, you know, throw rocks and kill them. Get them out of the congregation. It's like the, the kahal, the assembly. It's like serious business. That's Dell at noon. When you make the choice, the lightning bolt is what's next. So anyway, that's the word for suffering or judge between. So Yehuda, praise Yah, or initiate the study like those drops. Start, it, start the flow, and then the word Yahalam Basically, naphtali. So, 
Leah said, sacred schemes, sacred schemes. Have I wrestled with my sister and I figured out this sneaky way to, ah, I'll use my maidservant to get more children. And it's like, what's that got to do with the diamond? But so here we're just going through the order of this. Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, or Shimon. And then you got Yehuda, Dan, and Naphtali. So Naphtali lines up with strike, beat, suited, or fitted. Sacred schemes, fatal, fatal, naftal. Well, if you look it up, it has to. That word has to do with writhing and contorting, like a snake coil. You know, you step on a snake and it'll start whipping its body around. That's that's naftali. It's also understanding the Mishkan pattern in the Aleph Bet. Hmm. It's also understanding the reason for the Shabbat and the Moedim of Leviticus 23. It's the key, it's the code, and it looks like, ah, they're just contortions of a, of a people that's not us. Yahweh hid these things in the code, like teeth on a key, but it's also like the sacred schemes of wrestling between the family members. <clears throat> so I'm now projecting that these three words start the dripping. Hmm. That's the flow. One letter at a time. Learn the language. Learn the alphabet. Because it's the sapphire pavement, like brickwork of set stones in front of Yahweh's own throne in heaven that he showed Moshe in the Mount Sinai. And sapphire is the Tehillit blue. You could say sapphire and Tehillit are two different colors. But nevertheless, it's you, you knock the pieces in like puzzle pieces, fitted and suited sacred schemes each one of these letters fit together order and row and sequence and order the Mishkan pattern, the paleo, the pictograph, the number, the he uh, modern Hebrew Chaldean flame, the modern Hebrew cursive like ripples in the water, the petroglyph, the Greek, the English, and then the, 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 the picture telling the story. What I'm saying is it's like whatever whatever use those colors, those those meanings fit together like a puzzle, fit together like a pavement. Naphtali. Lining up with the word Yod Halamid Mem. Halamid is Hal is where you get the word for hallelujah and it means bright and brilliant and shining. Suited. So we could say, start the flow, that's, that's the study. Sephering the Mishkan pattern, it's all about the Lamed. Next row, Lamed Shin Mem, Shin Bet Vav, and Aleph Ket Lamed Mem He. Lasham, Shavu, and Achalma. Lining up with Gad, Asher, and Issachar. Gimel, Dalet, El, Shin, Resh, and Yod, Shin, Shin, Kaf, Resh. I don't think we're going to get to uh, Jeremiah in this particular study. No, we're okay. about we'll just 40 minutes. How much? We're 40 minutes. Okay, we're going to finish up these things about the stones. Yeah. Then we'll get into okay, Jeremiah. Because we're in the, in the third row now, correct? Third row, yeah. Yes. Lasham. Opal, right. or Jacinth, or Opalescence. Opalescence, mm -hmm. that's like, uh, you can get your car painted in Opalescent and different light, it looks different colors. It's or Australian opens, old opals are beautiful, fire opals. But the word means for the sake of, or according, in reference to, or reputation. Shem is name, fame, renown, reputation, and also here and there, and something about the essence of the character. Shin bet vav is an agate, and shin bet, vav is the masculine suffix, but shin bet he means to be taken captive it's the word shuva, or one who returns, like Shabbat, to, to return and dwell. One who returns, he dwells, he sits, abides. In reference to the reputation of, that's Lasham, Shavu, one who returns, or regarding the, yeah, these are those famous guys that were taken captive and never returned. I'm talking about the northern kingdom now, the house of Ephraim, mm -hmm. the last ten tribes, mm -hmm. I could suggest. Aleph, Chet, Lamed, Mem, He. Well, Chet, Lamed, Mem is healthy. Dreaming. If you go to a certain REM state of sleep, it, it, that's where it's, it's healthy, it's recoverable, it's recuperation, but it also means strong in cement. 
Aleph is I will, mem, hey, ma, the, the hey is the feminine suffix meaning to express or what it looks like in action that, that can be evidenced. So you could say if Aleph, ach, Aleph, het is the word for brother, lama is the word for why. It's like, why was our brothers lost? Because they had no regard. So this is going back to saying, why were, the, why were the ten tribes of the north taken captive? Why did they never return? They didn't care. Go back and look at Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. That's where the curse is laid out. The first 15 verses or so, 14 and 15 in both chapters, Yahweh describes what the blessing looks like. Kind of like this. Nature will cooperate. You'll have good food. You'll be at peace. Your mind will be appreciating just another day of life. This very day, in some cities, there's great trouble going on, even in America. Much, much more in other countries. But what I'm saying is that the, the blessing that Yahweh gives us in the first few verses of Leviticus 26, go back and read them, Deuteronomy 28, you look at the following 50 verses or so, and it's all hell, breaking loose on the face of the earth, just like the last 3,000 years of world history. So this is saying, in reference to the reputation, or according to, for the sake of, those taken captive, becoming, determining to be healthy, I could say accordingly, Ephraim returns to a restoration of health and strength, as, as was dreamt of. Who dreamed of that? I heard, I heard it said, maybe I'm wrong, Maybe I heard bad information, but you know, the, the Jews do this thing when they're praying, they're davening, they're, they, it's like, oh, come on, what are these guys? It's disturbing to see, and it's like, that's because you don't understand it. That's because we didn't learn that. From what I understand, somebody asked a Jewish guy, hey, what does that mean? He says, every time we do that motion, it's a prayer. Hmm. They have this whole concept behind the prayer, but as soon as they do this one bow, it is a prayer. So just because you don't understand it, you think, why are these guys bipping and bopping and weaving and... Shut up! They're praying! Now you may get down on your knees, you may hold your hands like this, or maybe you don't. Maybe you close your eyes, maybe you don't. Maybe you look up to heaven, maybe you lay on your face. It's a personal prayer. And what are they praying for? Well, this guy asked the Jewish guy, what are they praying for? And what he was told is that they're praying for Ephraim to come home. <laughs> Jeremiah 23. They're praying for you to repent and turn back to the words of this Torah to restore the family, the kingdom, as was Yahweh's own personal dream for it to happen. And we're going to mention that as in uh, Jeremiah 33, 9. Yahweh says it'll be for me, for himself, a rejoicing. What he looks forward to with all his heart is that day. We'll have to get into that in the next video. But don't knock what the Jews are doing. They're praying for you when they're bowing their heads mm. repeatedly. And if that's true, then that's what these three stones are about. For the sake of the brother, the ten tribes, the ten brothers who were lost because they had no regard of the Torah, no regard of the covenant, no regard of the great promises and the prestige of being the people of Yahuwah. Those ten tribes that are our ancestors scattered across the face of the earth. Not just Europe, not just known as the barbarian tribes, but all through Asia and up into Russia and down through North America, South America, through the Orient, down into Australia. It's like across the face of the earth, Yahweh said he'd scatter his people, which we're going to read about in this thing in Jeremiah, the next video here. But Yahweh says, we disgusted him. And so he ripped away all the blessings he had given our family, our nation, and he gave them to the infidels and scattered his people across the face of the earth. But he said he'd bring us back. And that's what this is, is a matter of coming back. Third row, in reference to these matters. Fourth row, Tavresh Shin Yodshin, Tarsis, Tarshish, Chrysolite Stone, Shin He Mem, Red Onyx, Shohem, and Yod Shin Pei He, Ya Shafa. Well, Tarsus, Res Tav Res Shin Yod Shin. Shin Yod Shin is the word for rejoice or six. Res Shin Shin is beaten down, destroyed, a clod of earth, 
and reduced to ruin. Rejoicing, beaten down and reduced to ruin like a, a pile of earth. What does that even mean? Reshin Yodshin means weak and unempowered, like somebody beaten down like a clod of earth. Reshin, poor beggar. But also to empower, authorize, permit, and allow. Then you look at Reshin with a different suffix, Reshin Vav Tav, or Reshin Tav, the last three letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So the, whatever message is written in the 22 letters, these last three at the end are statement at the conclusion that means something. Hmm. At the resurrection, or before the resurrection, or leading to... What is it talking about? Well, reshin, vav tav, is a plural suffix. It means net, retina, where we get you know, for the eyeballs, retic, reticular, retina. What does it do? It captures the light, sends it to the brain, and organizes it in such a way that we can see. It means authority and power, but it also means poverty. It means permission or freedom of action or ownership. Going back to that word that means set free, the word petochi, set free, regained sight, to be allowed to see, to be allowed to be set free. So here what I'm saying is that the ninth, or the uh, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, the tenth stone goes back to the word petochi chetom, chotom, which, which has to do with not just in an engraved signet, but there's something about that we were locked out, sealed up. Daniel is told, Daniel 12, 4, hide the word, seal the book until the time of Yakutz or Yakutz, Kufzadi, Yod Kufzadi means to awake, or sometimes we were able to come back and see again. And if it's been all the years until now, we cannot reference the last 2,000 or 2,730 or even the last 2,300 years where the name was taken out and the Septuagint gave us false words mm. and a false name for our Elohim, a, a, a change completely, reading from left to right instead of right to left, a different hemisphere of the brain. It's like we've just come out of 3,000 years of all kinds of, not just confusion, babble, but Yahweh himself perpetuated the curse and sustained it until at least 2010. And here we are, 10 years after, we're in 2020, and it's like, can we see? 2020, that's known as being able to see with both eyes clearly. So this first word, Tarsus, is having something to do with the, the poor, beaten down beggars find a way to receive the authority, the power, and the permission to have freedom of speech, freedom of sight, freedom of action. It's found in the covenant of Yahweh that he gave to our ancestors. That's the only place. It's, and, but also there's a demolition, because it means beaten down, destroyed, Rashish, a demolition of something. Well, what's happening right now around the world, around our country, is some kind of a demolition of the status quo. Oh, well, it's the new normal. Why can't we go back to what it was? And it's like, well, was it really all that great? We've been in a holding pattern for the last 10 years waiting for Yahweh to step in and do something. And this rhetorical comment. I, I, I'd, call many, it, huh? I'd call it the demolition of a failed system. How many of who has to do what, when, for how long, with what heart? sustaining us, proving that we're his people. Listen, we're keeping another Sabbath day. We're not working. We're keeping your Moedim. We're learning your language. We're calling upon your name. How long do we have to do this before it has an obvious effect? Well, we don't know. But all along, for the, ever since 2005, I, well, 2004, actually, I gave a talk in the Mishkan pattern, and we're talking about this. Hey, well, this should change something. Change what? When? How? For, Yah for Yahweh to stir up certain adversaries of, of a failed system? Am I saying that America is not great? Or that am I saying that Belgium isn't a wonderful place? Or am I saying that Uruguay is, needs to be destroyed? No, it has nothing to do with picking out certain nations. It has to do with Yahweh has set up for the last 2,000 years the structure, the organization of the world, and it's going to come to the place where when the fullness of the curse is accomplished, 2010, that his people turned to his ways. He said that he would dismantle the nations where he scattered his people. All the nations. And then bring his people back like he dismantled Egypt, brought his people out and gave them the promised land over in the Haaretz. Israel, he's going to do the same thing. And whether that means this one, no, not that, not my favorite stuff. It's sandcastles in the rain. It's a house of cards that he's <laughs> going to knock down. So should I begrudge? Well, I don't want to see the destruction of G. My favorite statue 
it was bad enough it got pigeons on it. Now we've got Antifa knocking them down in Seattle and in San Francisco. Rats. Oh well, too bad. That doesn't matter. My point is, the next word, Shin He Mem. Shin Vav Mem means to estimate or assess. Shin He, Mem can be a suffix, Shin can be a prefix. He Mem means them or they. Shin He means lamb or late. Shin He He, to tarry or delay. Neglected, omitted, distracted, detained. Shin He Vav He is leisure time or respite. So I could say, the little lambs were late. Why? Why is it that for 2,730 years, for 2,300 years, for nearly 3,000 years since the days of David, why is it that we lost the kingdom? Why is it that we got scattered and had other powers and entities, money people, people into power? I, I could say carpetbaggers. I could, you know, like after the Civil War, people, the, the, the Illuminati, the, the big shots, the the secret orders, I won't even mention their names, who have dominated. Why did Yahweh empower them? Because we ignored his Torah. We failed to have any value in these words. And we get, when we go through Jeremiah, the next video here, I'll run through a list as quickly as I can and tell you where to look. Read the book of Jeremiah and take it as a present tense thing. You'll see what I'm talking about. So we delayed Yahweh's favor. Just, be, just exactly like when the Israelites got out of Egypt, they were afraid of the giants, and so they brought on 40 years of wandering and death that was unnecessary. So we have sustained, the northern house of Israel has sustained 2,730 years of wandering and death, with Yahweh imposing villainous overlords because we didn't have a value for his words of instruction. And we'll look at them in Jeremiah to prove the matter. So for us to turn back to his words is what will change the world scene. And regardless of what the, I'm going to call them bad guys, our adversaries, those who, the pirates, the pirate scene, those who just break things and destroy, have the, have the representation of their logo of the skull and crossbones, here is a promise of death, you know, you, 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 you don't agree with us, you don't cater to us, and we will kill you. That's what the skull and crossbones means, but, uh, you know, Yahweh is the covenant of life. Last word, yon sh shin pei hei. Well, the word shin pei hei, shafa, means to sweep bare, compensated, indemnified. That means to be repaid like having an insurance company. It means quiet, sane, at ease put over the fire, to restore to health. And it's the word for language. Oh. Lip and language. He will restore the language, <laughs> the study of Hebrew. So I could say these last three words mean the empowered, the unempowered become authorized because even though they had delayed the whole story, again, this picture, the storyline down at the bottom with these pictures, they had put off and not had access to what belonged to them. Sheen, prefix, what belongs to hey, mem. What had belonged to them? The covenant. But because our forefathers and us had not been told, not been taught. It was under the confines of a curse. So it was held in abeyance. It was held back from us. But as the language is restored, sheen, pay, hey, so we will be indemnified and compensated and sweep clean the debris of ruin. So this word, zechakadan, that picture down in the corner of the, of the saber-toothed tiger, one who laughs heartily because he knows the revival of the hook, the constitution of the kingdom of Yah. So zechak, laughter, not Snickers. It's not a Snickers candy bar. <laughs> the little smile on that. Ah, that's on the website. I'm trying to. Oh, I'll get it up there soon. But my point is, the Yahuwah, the Elohim of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Abraham, mount up with wings to soar as an eagle. How many minutes we got? It's gonna. Okay, we got to shut this off a couple minutes before down here in the Dalit position, to mount up with wings airborne, to flying over the clouds. Z Yitzhak, laughter, 
and Yaakov, literally we get the word for to be cubed, or put in the third dimension, power of, of, of three, where, they, where Islam has the Kaaba stone. It's the same word, Kaab, cube, Yaakov, and it means to, if, you know, we, we face like, you know, two-dimensional obstacles, but to go up into the third dimension laughing and just go over the top. And for Yahweh to say, man, I'd given you guys everything. He even said, if you had only grabbed a hold of Mauzi, my, my moose, my moose, my moozy, if you would have grabbed a hold of what I gave you, my glory and power and splendor, everything I said would have happened. This has never ceased to be a powerful... E equals MC squared existed even in the 1920s be, or the 1900s before Einstein ever put it together, if it's even a true equation. Some people say, oh, yeah, there's a modification to it. But back in the 1800s, whatever the truth of it was still there, back in the 1500s, back in, you know, 1500 BC, the days of Moshe, e equals MC squared was a reality, but the people didn't realize, so they couldn't capitalize because they couldn't put it into effect. This covenant has been a real thing in effect, including the 2,730 years of being trapped, locked up, and inaccessible. Not because of the devil, but because Yahuwah kept it from his people. But as of 2010, man, this is all available. The word Dan, Dalit Ayanun, means a scientist, the one who goes about the scientific study of the knowledge of Zachacha, the laughter. Zadi Chet Kuf, well... Zadi Chet is that bright, shining, dynamic, woohoo, like fireworks in the sky. And Kuf, uh, Chet Kuf is the word for constitution and engraved. So it's the same engravings of going back here to the Patoch, Petov Vav Chet Yod, Chet Vav Tov Men, Patochi Chotam. Because we'd taken a vow, our forefathers took a vow, and it was carved in stone, and we signed up as the signatories, we are also the receivers of the benefits now that it has been opened to us. And if part of that means that Yahuwah is going to dismantle the existing structure of the nations in order to give the treasure back to us, we should be going, Hodullah, Yawaki Tov, Kile Olam Chazdo, forever is Hello. his chesed. Chet Samik Dalit. Chet Samik is refuge. Samik Dalit is secret, hidden foundation. The meanings of these letters in this language that we are restoring back to the reality in across the world, people's consciousness, for them to hear, for them to shema, for us to be Simeon, for us to be the ones. We can sit here and look back at the names of these 12 tribes and be the character of each one of those names yeah. related to the stones. There's a message in there, and the message is, we win. The message is, Yahweh restores his favor to his people, and this idea that the bad guys win on this earth, and we just get to win when they kill us to go to heaven, I disagree with. We win on the face of this earth, and even though Yeshua said, my kingdom's not of this world, that's right, his powers are beyond reach. Hilarious laughter soaring over the clouds into a dimension that those guys have no access to, and I can choose to believe this scenario. Oh, but it's just like a fairy tale, the big bad wolf and the three little pigs and Goldilocks and, and Snow White. It's like, mock it all you want. It's the story I read in the scripture, and we're going to read in Jeremiah, 20, Jeremiah, first 30 chapters here in just a few minutes, and uh, yeah, I'll try to lay it out. Shabbat Shalom.